Good morning. If you were late this morning, you owe it to yourself to go online and see the video we did with Bryce Early. Our spoof on the AT&T commercial with the little children about Mother's Day. So I don't know who you are, but if you missed that video, you need to see it. It would be worth your time. That was hilarious. I'd like to be around their home after um, Mama sees the video. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we're coming to the end of our series on uh, Not a Fan. And uh, to me, it's been a very challenging uh, uh, series and thoughts as we've preached about it. And today we're going to talk about, um, is Jesus enough? And basically, have you ever had a come to Jesus meeting with anybody? It's interesting that we call those meetings a come to Jesus meeting. And I think maybe we're, this time we're going to talk about having a come to Jesus meeting with Jesus. How about that? But, you know, a, a come to Jesus meeting is one of those uh, times that it's really, you're going to have a tough discussion with somebody in a very tense moment. And if you're the one that has to deliver the speech, um, maybe you don't sleep very well the night before. Or maybe if you're the one that's going to receive it, you're not sleeping very well the night before if you know something's coming up. Uh, we have them with all kinds of people. Sometimes you have them within your family. Sometimes parents have to have them with their children. Sometimes uh, spouses have them with each other. Uh, sometimes a boss uh, has it, or you have to do it with a coworker. I remember one time I had a come to Jesus meeting. It was my district superintendent. I was in my 30s, and I was pastoring this church. The church was doing very well, but there were some people in the church that I don't know how to say this otherwise than they hated me. I know that's what I'm saying. Can you believe that? I mean, <laughs> lovable rule. Who can hate him? But anyway, I'm probably a little better now than I was in my 30s too, so I'll grant that part of it. But they were writing letters to the bishop, and they were some pretty vicious letters. And what happened is they would write these letters to the, my bishop, and my bishop would then forward the letters to the district superintendent, and then the district superintendent would then mail me the letters. So I'm reading this stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking, um, I said, well, I'm not going to defend myself. It was just the kind of thing where, you know, I'm in God's hands, I'm in the Lord's hands, and, you know, what will be will be was just about the attitude that I was taking. And, but one morning... I got a phone call from my district superintendent, and he says, I'm coming up to your church, and I'm going to be visiting people in your community all day long, church members. I want a church membership list, and I'm going to see a number of people. I want you to stay right there at your house, and I'll see you at the end of the day. That was a stress-filled day that day. and In fact, uh, he came and got me, and I made a couple of visits with him to the people. We he went out and talked about my ministry and asked people questions and, and whatever else. It, and we met at the end of the day, and it was an, an interesting meeting. I'll save the rest for the end of the sermon today about the outcome. But I just say that come to Jesus meetings are not always, uh, they're, they're always tense. But I think the reason we call them come to Jesus meetings is because they are um, truth times. It's just time to tell the truth. And we need to do that uh, with Jesus. Uh, we've been talking about, we started with the first session, talking about having a DTR meeting with Jesus, sitting down, having a define the relationship meeting with Jesus. Where you sit down and you mostly identify that with maybe a dating relationship. And you say, you know, well, where are we here? And, and the challenge was to just sit down with Jesus and say, you know, what, what kind of relationship we've got going on? Here, what's going on? And, and we learned that there's a difference between being a fan and, and, a, and a follower. And I don't know if you were in my session, but I I'd, I'd talked about being a fan of Mickey Mantle when I preached on that uh, particular uh, message. And I had his baseball card, and I knew all about him, but, you know, never knew him at all. And the thing is, we can know, fans know about Jesus, but followers know Jesus. Followers know who Jesus 
or, and they develop this intimate relationship with Jesus where nothing is out of bounds, nothing is off the table, so to speak, that Jesus is free to come and bring up any subject and bring up anything. Nothing is out of bounds. And, and followers learn to live with this mantra that we discovered in the book of Luke where he says, you know, if any person desires to come after me, he has to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And uh, that's how we live each day. And then last week, we talked about the temptation to, to go from a relationship uh, with Christ to making the relationship a little bit about rules. And sometimes it's easy to get where you, you do things so uh, frequently, it becomes very ritualistic to you. And we kind of get a little checklist of things. Okay, I do that, I do that. And then we start, you know, that uh, following Jesus about don't do this and do this or don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And, those, and it becomes a, a, a legalistic rule-keeping kind of thing. But today we get to the time where I want to ask you, might you have a come to Jesus meeting with Jesus. Where, imagine yourself sitting at a table with him, and, and he basically looks at you, and, and, and he very tenderly and lovingly looks at you. It, this is not something that's come down hard, but he just says, am I enough? Am I enough? Now, before you run off and give the Sunday school answer and everything, yeah, 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 he's plenty, he's enough, and all that. I want you to think about that. Jesus is asking us, am I enough? I love the book of John. And John never called himself John when he's writing in the gospel of John. He always called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he, knew, he, he felt this love and this special relationship. Uh, but he begins the book with uh, talking about John the Baptist has come on the scene. Now, John the Baptist is kind of, I mean, he's just strange older cousin of Jesus. But he's kind of like Grizzly Adams. Now, if you're under 40, just go Google it. The <laughs> rest of you know about Grizzly. I mean, he's wearing these camel pelts, and he's eating locust and honey. And, you know, he's preaching repentance and, and all that, that kind of stuff. And, and the people, and he's drawing huge crowds out in the desert. I mean, all, huge crowds of people coming up saying, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we're looking for? And he was very clear about it. He says, no, I'm not. Although I imagine he might have been tempted. I mean, with all these big crowds and everybody coming and asking him, are you the Messiah? You know, we get, well, maybe I am. I thought I was the forerunner. I mean, they seem to think so. I remember in seminary, our professor says, don't listen to the older ladies when they go out the door. They're going to tell you you're greater than Billy Graham ever thought to be. Don't listen. They're going to tell you this and they're going to tell you that. Don't listen to the older ladies when they go out the door. So he was not listening to them. He said, no, I am not the Messiah. In fact, I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. In fact, John the Baptist baptized Jesus to kind of inaugurate him in, in the ministry there. And, and, and here was the lesson that he got. It, it was a, it's a good thing when you and I get to the point where we realize we are not the Messiah. There is a God, and he's not me. There is a God, and I am not him. John the Baptist says, I'm not the Messiah. And this is a great place to start. I can't fix anything. I can't even fix myself. I am not the Messiah. Powerlessness is not a bad place to be in when we start relating to Jesus. It's the truth. I mean, if you could change stuff and you had power, you'd do it, wouldn't you? You'd fix yourself and everybody else. So here's a good place. We're going back to this come to Jesus meeting. A good place to start in this meeting with him, is to realize I am not the Messiah. So then, is Jesus enough? Is he enough? Well, John organizes his book around seven 
things that Jesus says when he says, I am. And he gives seven things. So I'm probably going to set a world record here. But we're going to go through those seven things really quickly. Don't worry. You might want to put your seatbelt on. But we'll, we'll get done real quick like. But I think Jesus is answering that question. Am I enough for us? First, he says, Jesus offers me life in my spirit. He says, I am the bread of life. And if you eat this bread, you will never go hungry. He says, I am that bread of life. In other words, we are more than flesh and blood. We're spirit. In fact, if you can write this statement down, you'll have a good statement the rest of the time. We are spiritual beings having a brief human experience. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. <laughs> we are spiritual beings having a very brief human experience. And Jesus is saying, you need more than just flesh and blood stuff. You need more than just what's going to take care of your physical needs. There's a gap and there's a hole in you, and I'm the only one that can fill it. It's this bread. You eat this bread and you won't go hungry again. You try drugs, you're going to need more. You try to shop and buy and have everything, you can't shop and buy enough. I could go on and on and on. There is never enough to fill that gap and that hole. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he said, man cannot live by bread alone. This is a different kind of bread. I am your soul food. Then secondly, Jesus offers me understanding or illumination. He says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. As a, you know, you ever notice like on Friday nights when the football stadium is all lit up and it's dark and, and it's, it's like lights up the, the whole area or, or if the softball games are going on at the ball field, you can see those lights and everything. It'll light up the sky all around in Niceville. Jesus wasn't saying, I'm the light of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus wasn't saying, I'm, I'm the light of the nation of Israel. Jesus wasn't saying, I'm the light of the planet Earth. He said, I am the light of the world, cosmos. If you could get to the very end of it. He says, I'm the light of it all. I'm going to come to shine on your darkness. Now, in this church, we talk about hurts and habits and hang-ups and the struggles that we all face and, and overcoming all that we are and all that we've been through and, and all that we're trying to face and all that. And, and Jesus is like, you know, he said, I'm, I'm so sorry to see you stumbling in your darkness. And I want you to know that I've come to be the light. I'm going to shine light on your darkness so that you can see and that you no longer need to continue to stumble and hurt yourself and fall. There's a new way of living, and I am coming to bring the light, to shine the light for you. Third one, Jesus offers me security. I am the gate, he said. Now, He's using a metaphor here of shepherds and sheep and, you know, the first century shepherds. By the way, that was a 24-7 job. That wasn't something you just took care of during the day and went home. You're, you're with these sheep all the time. So it comes nighttime and you're, you've, maybe you've either made a pen or had a pen and, and you put them in the pen. And a lot of times a shepherd would just, just sleep and stay right there in the, the gate to keep the wolves out and the sheep in. And Jesus says, I am the gate. I'm the gate. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you from the, the ravenous wolves in this culture. I'm going to protect you from the ravenous wolves that live on the inside of you. I'll protect you about the ravenous, well, Peter calls them a lion who's seeking whom he may devour, our enemy Satan. I will be your protection. I am enough for your security. Then fourth, Jesus offers me relationship. He says, I'm the good shepherd. He says, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. I know my sheep by name. 
Jesus knows every one of them. He knows us. He knows our voice. But do we know his voice? He knows our voice. You know, I've just given up, quit trying to play telephone jokes with people and everything because just as soon as I start talking, they say, that's you, Rule. I know your voice anywhere. <laughs> Cell phones has helped a little bit. Sometimes I can call the church and they don't recognize my voice because of the cell phone. That's fun. <laughs> it brings out the inner kid in me. But anyway, you know, when, when, uh, today's Mother's Day and happy Mother's Day to y'all, all of you. When I, when I think of relationship and I think of a baby and a mother and, and what all that involves, and you talk about knowing voices. You know, a mama knows that baby's voice, and that baby really knows mama's voice. And I think what Jesus is saying is there, there's a relationship here that I'm wanting to have with you where we have that kind of intimacy, where we know one another. You know my voice. I know your voice. And the question for us is, do we know his voice? We need to get used to where we hear his voice and know his voice. We used to sing in the traditional, the hymn, Softly and Tender, Jesus is Calling Me. Fifthly, he offers me abundant and eternal life. By the way, these are listed in your connect notes if you haven't forgot to mention that to you. I am the resurrection and the life, he says to Martha and Mary when they're so upset with him that he's, he was late getting to the, to the tomb where Lazarus was. You know, his Lazarus had been sick and, and he died. And they said, if you would, if you would have been here, we could have, you could have saved his life. You know, if Jesus would have gotten there five years later, he would have still been on time. He could have still brought him forth even then. And he's saying... He said to them, I am the resurrection and the life. I am life now for you, and I am life for you to come. Is anybody else promising you eternal life? Is anybody else promising you an abundant life in this life? Is he enough? He says, I have come. The reason I've come is that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly and that you might have it forever and ever, eternally. That spiritual being that you are, having the little brief human experience, is going to continue living forever and ever. The Spirit is eternal. Jesus is offering me abundant and eternal life. Then sixthly, Jesus offers me the way to God. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is with the disciples there in the upper room. He's talking about being tortured and beaten and killed. And he tells them that they'll, but they will know the way. And, and Thomas says, well, which way is the way? How can we know the way? I felt that way. Many times, you know, to ask Jesus, you know, why, why, what do you mean? Where's the way? Which way are you going? Where is it going to happen? Why is this, this going on? Why is this happening? I felt just like Thomas. And it always brings me back to a deeper surrender to him. And he just basically says, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Am I enough? That question just continues to be there. Will you trust me? And say, okay, Lord, I'll trust you. I, I have nothing else to trust in other than you. And I'll just write that down on my little imaginary book of questions that I'll ask you another day. The way to God. He says, I am the way. He's not one of the ways. He's not a way. He says, I am the way to God. He's rose from the dead. He alone took care of my sin, past, present, and future. And I can stand one day before Almighty God because of Jesus and his righteousness. As the old hymn says, dressed in his righteousness alone. He is the way to God, and he is enough. And then lastly, Jesus offers me a life that matters. I am the vine, he said. You are the branches. He's there in the upper room. He's telling me, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He wants you to know if you abide in him, 
that you will bear much fruit. Want to have a life that matters? Want to have a life that counts? Want to have a life that has eternal significance to it? It's through Jesus. You know, everybody wants significance. I can tell you that. It won't significant. Some, some people want it built in statues. But the way to have significance is to do things of eternal value. And that will be significant. And that will be the difference. As we seek to live out our lives, if we're with the vine and the branch, you'll be living out your life through the power of God's Holy Spirit. That power that raised Jesus from the dead will be living through you. And Jesus said, you were meant to live a life that matters. And if you connect your life to me, you will. In those seven statements, Jesus is saying, I'm enough. I'm more than enough. In fact, we sing that Chris Tomlin song, all of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and for every need, you satisfy me with your love, and all I have in you is more than enough. Is that your heart song? If you and Jesus were to have a come to Jesus meeting, is that your heart's cry? I'll tell you the end of that story. A district superintendent came and sat down with me in my living room, and he said, I've gone to all these people and everything. He says, you know, I'm firmly in your corner. And, you know, I'm, there are some things I'm going to make the church uh, tell me how they're going to support their pastor. They don't have to say how, you know, I'm not saying you have to stay here at this church, but I'm going to make sure that they support you and that they articulate to me the ways that they're going to have to learn how to support a pastor. Now, that turned out uh, to be a, a very good thing. It was a, it was a traumatic time. It was a painful time, but it was good for me. But I had kept all those letters and all the correspondence and all the stuff. I'd, I'd kept those files. And I had kept them as kind of a way of a, kind of a, a monument of how God had been faithful to me and how he had gotten me through a very difficult time at a very crucial moment in my life. And it's been within the year. We were going through some old files in our house. We were cleaning out the filing cabinets and things like that. And there were all those old files and records of those meetings and the various things that had I shortened it down to one day for you. And I was going back through all of those things and looking at some of the letters and reading some of it. And it was almost like the Lord said to me, he said, was I enough? Am I enough for you? And I said, yes. You are more than enough. He said, you can throw these away now. And I threw them in the trash can. They're gone. <laughs> gone. He is enough. That's what he's asking. Sit down with him. He looks at you eyeball to eyeball. And he wants to know from He wants to hear from you. Am I enough? And he spent his life and his message trying to show each one of us how he's more than enough. And I want to invite you this morning. In fact, I think there's a card might have got put in your thing. There's a place that says, I want to move from a fan to a follower. Maybe you like to check something. We'd like to hear from you. Maybe it's a time where you can 
sit there and make a commitment, step across a line. Maybe the Lord's been speaking to you and all this. The first one says, I'm committing myself to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you've been going through this series. You've been patiently and faithfully listening, and we encourage room to think things through. Maybe today is a day where you're stepping over the lines, and that's, that's it. You do that, and we'll also make sure we get you some materials uh, to, in becoming a Christian. The second was, I'm rededicating my life to Jesus. You know, one of the things that scares me to death, even uh, being a pastor and in the ministry, it's so easy to slip into being a fan. and not a follower. So the question, am I enough, continues to come before you in, in various issues and ways. So maybe today you'd say, you know, I've been a follower. I've slipped into a fan. <laughs> I want to be a follower again. I want to be baptized on Sunday, June the 9th. We're just having a baptismal service that day. And if you've not been baptized and would like to, that's a, that's a great day. You don't have to be baptized on that day. We would do it most any Sunday that you wanted to. I want to become a member of the, the church here. I would like to find out more about the Next Steps class. I'd like to join a small group. So put your name and email and phone. And uh, there are baskets as you go out the door. You can just drop that in the basket. We would love to hear from you as this becomes your kind of commitment time at the end of this series. Okay, it's decision time. I've listened to these messages. I've read the book or been in a small group, if you have been, and say, now's the time to take a step. Now's the time to do something. John the Baptist, they came to him later on in his ministry, a little bit further on, and they said, Jesus is having more bigger crowds than you are. Are you the Messiah? He's having bigger crowds. And you know what he said? <laughs> he gave us the secret of how to stay a follower of Jesus Christ. He said, no, I'm not the one. In fact, here's the deal. I must, he must become greater and greater, and I must decrease. He must increase, and I must decrease. That's the secret to staying a follower. I must decrease more and more, and he must increase more and more. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning as we grapple with our lives and what we need to do. I mean, John the Baptist knew he couldn't fix his powerless life, and we can't either. And the secret to following Jesus, to say, Jesus, you increase and let me decrease. I am not the Messiah, and Jesus, you increase and let me increase. Is Jesus enough? You bet. You bet he is. He's enough. Amen. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the Word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.